All right, we're going to continue with the chapter 22 PowerPoints, just kind of help you out with uh, what to focus on. Now, the first, uh, let's see here, hold on. Let me go to slideshow. Now I can go to, there we go, now I have a pen. Um, let's go back to where we left off here and I'll start here with evidence of evolutionary change so these are your the types of evidence we have and uh, let me start with the fossil record I'm not going to review the fossil record much um, actually I'm none I'm gonna let you watch the movie there's a movie that I'm a documentary that I'm gonna have you watch and they discuss what Darwin did in South America and from that, you can get an idea of how the fossil record is used to uh, determine uh, how evolution occurs and uh, the proof from there. Uh, I think the Darwin example is a really good one. So when you watch this movie, it's called What Darwin Never Knew. I'm going to have it linked uh, on the page. You'll need to watch this documentary. And uh, early in the movie, they will talk about South America. And Darwin did not just visit the Galapagos Islands, but he also went to South America and he noticed some uh, some fossils there and uh, he recorded that, hey, there used to be some uh, large animals deeper in the fossil record, but today we don't see those, those, those animals. They don't look the same. They're much smaller. Uh, and in fact, there's a giant sloth. Uh, there are cases of armadillos. And, uh, of course, they used to be giant creatures, you know, the size of a car at one point, and today, well, they're tiny animals. And so this is uh, part of the fossil record that uh, Darwin uses to support uh, his concepts of natural selection and ultimately evolution. Uh, and this also has to do with biogeography. As the geography changes, the organisms change. They adapt to how the the environment changes so that's nothing new now something that is new that we're going to cover here with some stories that i'm going to give you are convergent uh evolution and homologous uh, so i'm going to this term not homologies uh, i'll just call it homologous versus convergent and i'm going to compare these two concepts uh because they are kind of like the opposite uh uh, concept of each other and they both support this idea of how uh, things change. Now selective breeding that's just like dog breeding when you select the dog so I've already covered this. So really what we need to talk about very briefly or maybe not so briefly here is the convergent and homologous uh, con concepts. So the con concept of convergent evolution and homolo uh, homologous evolution. So uh, I'm going to clear this, and I'm, I'm just going to draw here some ideas. Uh, and I'll start with the convergent. Let's see, I'm going to clear the screen. Let's see. There we go. And I'm going to start talking about this, convergent evolution. Uh, convergent evolution, there are two different ideas. There, we have to understand that the environment shapes how organisms change. All right, so we have to understand the environment all right when it changes all right change just do ch for change then the organisms that live in this environment in in nature you know suddenly it gets hotter colder wetter drier uh, whatever, then the organisms have to change or in order to survive. And I'll abbreviate that, but that's supposed to be organisms. So when the environment changes, the organisms will understandably have to change. They have to adapt. All right. So the idea that when something changes, uh, they they have to adapt and this comes with the idea that sometimes there are organisms that are a lot better at adapting in general to all environments than others 
So I'm just going to call this the concept of the good idea. So let's say there is an organism um, that appears, all right, and it has a really useful adaptive advantage. Maybe it is the first organism to develop appendages. So I'm going to just draw it kind of like this. So this is these are appendages. And this is a really good idea. You can use it maybe to move things around or to move yourself. There are just so many things you can do with an appendage. So these things are super successful. So all the previous organisms that look, you know, kind of like this or this, they're not so, they're, they're okay, they're surviving, but this one can just do so much more. It can move around a little better. It can defend itself maybe. Maybe it can gather more food. It, 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 this idea, this really good idea, it's a mutation, ends up being really good for this organism. And it kind of like succeeds where these don't. And it can go places that these don't. So let's say this organism, all right, is living in a, an area that's really favorable to all organisms. It's really good conditions in this area. But over here, there are, let's say, some mountains. And over here, there is a swamp. I'll just kind of draw it, kind of get the idea that there's a swamp there. And over here, there's a forest. There are some trees, really ugly trees here, sorry. And this organism with the limbs, let's draw one here, it can live in these all of these areas. Maybe not as well as it can live here. This is easy living here make on a plane or something, someplace where it's nice and easy for an organism to live. But, of course, these are going to take over this area. Oops, didn't mean to do that. All right, and you're gonna get mostly these, right? These are gonna overpopulate this region. And, you know, sometimes these are gonna be so successful, maybe they even cause these to go extinct. So, you know, you end up with a bunch of these and they're probably going to really overpopulate this area. And so they're gonna be pushed out. And since these are kind of more successful organisms than these original ones, they can actually maybe survive over here. So the other ones couldn't survive over here in these differing environments, your swamp, your mountains, and your forest. And they're gonna be living in these other regions and over millions of years, they are going to adapt to those regions. So in other words, these pretty much stay the same. They have no pressure on them. We call that evolutionary pressure. They have no pressure to change that are living in this nice flat plain. But the ones in the trees, they have maybe some pressure to climb the trees and get some food. Maybe there's some food in the trees. So they're going to adapt to that. How are they going to adapt to that? They are going to develop maybe uh, longer limbs that maybe can grasp or something like that and can move into the trees. All right. Um, uh, actually, I'm de describing, sorry, I'm describing homologous first. Uh, I didn't say that. Uh, but uh, over here, uh, these organisms are developing in the swamp and the swamp uh, is mushy, you know, you need long legs to be able to walk in the swamp. Uh, so maybe they develop similar limbs, but instead for climbing, they are designed more like legs for walking in swampy conditions. All right, so this one was for swinging, but the, the limbs aren't exactly the same. This is more like legs and these are more like arms. And let's, over here in the mountains, well, you, it would be nice to be able to get up and get around these mountains easily. Maybe these turn their appendages into wings. All right, so the appendage becomes a wing over here. All right, and each of those start out with this one good idea that made them very successful, allowed them to move out of their 
normal habitat and then move into the others and then over many thousands if not millions of years this original organism adapts to these different places in other words they become different species all right now you always started with this original good idea the original good idea all right is the idea that um you needed you had one thing and you adapted it to different environments so understand you the idea with homologous we're doing homologies first sorry i said i was going to start with convergent and then i went and told you the homologous story so we're starting here so the idea is you have you start with a good idea or a good mutation that gives you an advantage In this case, the idea here is an appendage. You know, maybe another good one to, to survive someplace uh, would be to have multiple appendages, like most animals. Maybe you have three or four on each side. That would adapt to a different place. Uh, so, you know, many different ways you could use this concept of an appendage uh, to survive in different environments but they all started out with the original one here and so this is called these appendages are called homologous structures homologous so if something is homologous it means that at one point you had an ancestor that had a basic version of whatever your advantage is and it, it, it's still with you, but it has changed from your ancestor, all right? And then you might have like a cousin over here who moved someplace else and they took that same first time advantage and turned it into something else. So all of these, all of these have a homologous structure in that their appendages are similar, but not quite the same. And we call these homologous. So in other words, here these swinging arms and these uh, swamp walking legs and these uh, wings are all homologous to one another. And they all, it's because they all came from an original good idea way back in an ancestor that you had that first got the appendage. And then each one of these organisms, they became different species and in doing so, or what, why we call them different species is because they used this good idea in a different way and from this homologous structure. So all of them have homologous limbs, if you want to call it that. So these limbs are homologous, these organisms are homologous, and in the sense that they have a common ancestor that had a common structure and then each one of them moved somewhere and used that structure in a different way. So you need to understand the concept of homology, all right? So what, what are, like humans, humans and cats. Well, your arms are homologous to the front legs of a cat. Your legs are, as a human, are homologous to the hind legs of a cat, all right? Those are homologous structures, all right? Uh, the, uh, the fins on a whale are homologous to the arms on a human. It's hard to believe. And then whales, of course, just lost their legs. They don't have legs anymore, but we still have a homologous structure uh, in the front limbs. In other words, our arms are homologous to the uh, flin, fins, flippers, I guess, uh, whatever you want to call them, of a whale. All right, so keep that in mind that, uh, and we do have a common ancestor uh, with whales. Whales were once land animals that moved into the uh, uh, ocean, uh, if you remember the, the hippo and the whale story. All right, so that's an idea. You need to understand homologies or homologous. And so it can be at the chemical level, molecular, it can be at the developmental level, or it can be anatomical. This is an anatomical version of it. So you need to understand this concept, be able to at least tell me a general story or be able to answer questions if I ask you, like I did here, what is the analogous uh, structure 
on a cat from a whale's flippers and you'd go the front paws, right? Um, now, convergent evolution is a different way of looking at it. Um, so let me erase everything and uh, let me do, uh, it is better that I told you homolog homologous structures first and then convergent. Uh, it's kind of the opposite. Here you have two organisms, let's say, that live in different places, all right, but move into a new one. So this is the new area. That's an N, sorry. New, uh, new area. No organisms are living here. And we have two types of organisms. We have a round organism and we have the square organism. And they are not related. Uh, at least in recent history. So they both move into this new area. But let's say they move into this new area, and uh, I won't say that there are no organisms. There, There is a predator um, like this. I'll just draw something here to, to symbolize a predator. So in other words, they move here, and this is a good place to live, but this thing will chase them and try to eat them. So, in other words, they are both under, when they move in here, they are both under a stress. That stress from the environment is the predator. All right, sometimes you think of a stress as, um, you know, too dry, too wet, too, uh, too hot, too cold. But you get stresses from other organisms as well. And those stresses come from, like, this predator that hunts them down and eats them. So they are trying to develop something to get away or protect themselves from the predator. And if this particular predator is, say, a ground organism, maybe the only way to get away from it is to develop wings. Now you can see that neither of these have appendages, but maybe that's what they have to do. They both, to get away from the predator, they evolve to have wings. All right. And here your square one also develops wings. They might not be the same exact structure, but they function the same. And that's the key here. Before you had the same structure develops new, new, uh, new function. That was in homologies. So homologies were same structure. That's the same same structure, that appendage, all right, but when they moved to a new place, they developed new functions. So functions, whether it was in the wings. Here, oops, what we're going to do in convergent is these two are going to converge. They're both going to develop a new structure with the same function. So both of them have a stressor on them that make them need a new function. They need to fly. So it's going to be same function and it leads to new structures. Same function, but new all right, structure. Sorry, I should have made something else to write on here for this one. But this is the difference between, over here, this is homologous. These are what we talked about before. This is homologous structures. These are convergent. Oops, well, ignore that line. Convergent, so C-O-N-vergent structure. So this is an idea of convergence. Two organisms under the same stress develop the same structure. They develop wings. Our old one, homology, was everybody had the same structure, but they moved to a new environment, and that led to new functions. So here you have one structure, new environment and therefore new function. Over here you have you start out with different environments that move to a new environment 
and they don't have any new structures. They, they have to develop brand new structures, but they have the same function. So a good example of the convergent one, the one over here that we're talking about in this picture, are birds and insects. Both of them moved into onto the land at some point in history, and it became advantageous to develop wings. Now, they have different types of wings. The square one might be the insect, and so insect wings don't look like bird wings, all right? They are instead, you know, they, they just, you can tell they're not from <clears throat> a, a, a common ancestor. You didn't just have a common ancestor and then adapt those structures to the new thing. You developed brand new structures. So bird wings and insect wings would be an example of convergent evolution. Uh, homologies would be more like the cats and the humans, all right, where the front paws and the arms are essentially con uh, homologous. But convergent would be two sets of wings, one being from an insect and one being from a bird. Another good example are, are bat wings. Bat wings, insect wings, and uh, bird wings all develop from different structures. Those are instances of convergent. They all organisms found the need to fly, uh, found it advantageous to develop these structures, but they did it in a completely different way. The, the need was there. The, the, the environmental stressor was the same, all right, when they had need to get into the air, but all three organisms did it a different way. Um, and that is different from convergent. So you need to be able to compare and contrast convergent and uh, homologies. So the idea of convergent evolution and homologous structures or homologous evolution, those are the two competing ideas here on each side where it involves environmental stressors, but it involves, uh, one of them involves all, all organisms going to different environments and taking this kind of good idea and changing it in a different way in each environment, that's homologous. Convergent is when two organisms move into the same environment, not different ones, but same environment. They're under the same stress and therefore they develop uh, similar structures uh, that are brand new. They, they do not have any common uh, historical uh, structure that they they came from that was the same on both. They just made brand new structures under this stress of needing to fly. All right, so those are two very important concepts uh, that you will need to know for the exam. These are probably some of the hardest ideas, this convergent and homologous idea. Uh, students struggle with this sometimes, and you will need to know the difference, know examples of them, and uh, be able to compare and contrast them. Know that, okay, which one is caused by, um, you know, um, a, a new stressor, two organisms moving into the same environment? That would be convergent, all right? And also know when you have a single organism moving into several different environments, that would be homology. You need to compare and contrast and have these concepts down. All right, moving on here. Um, you can read these definitions. Uh, uh, they will help a little, uh, but I'm not going to ask you definitions like homologous structures or um, convergent evolutions. Um, let's see. Uh, selective breeding is just essentially it's what you think of. It's artificial selection versus natural selection, and artificial selection is dog breeding. You take, uh, you decide you want a smaller dog, so you take two small dogs, breed them together, and you get an even smaller dog. All right, you want a big dog, you take two larger dogs, breed them together, and get an even larger dog. This is artificial selection, all right? That, you need to understand that term, all right? And understand that Darwin used this concept. Make for sure when I have you watch the movie, you pay attention to uh, dog breeding. They talk about it uh, quite a bit in the, uh, in the film. It's called What Darwin Never Knew and uh, they will talk about this as one of the influences on Darwin's idea, uh, how he came to the conclusion of how evolution worked. Uh, here we just got some dogs. We've already gone over this part. 
uh, biogeography. Uh, it's the idea that um, extinct and modern species, uh, you look at how the environment or the geography changed, uh, the organisms changed. The ones that were well adapted before probably went extinct because they couldn't survive. And then the, the species that now are, exist in an area after there's been an environmental change are going to be different. It just makes sense. Uh, we study this a lot by looking at islands because organisms on islands are uh, isolated. And so when they're isolated, they don't interbreed with the other organisms and they uh, evolve very quickly. All right. Um, so know this, know the term endemic, uh, this idea. Um, so different foxes on different islands. So the one on the mainland versus the one on the island, they look different because the environments are different. All right, so that's pretty good. And we've already talked about the uh, Convergent evolution, read through these that have to do uh, with the book. Um, I've covered them pretty well. The idea is I want you to know the concepts, but it's also good to know a couple of examples. Um, uh, they In the movie, they will talk about this uh, organism called Tectolic. Uh, here it is. And so when you start to read the uh, or watch the movie, uh, pay attention to this organism. I will probably ask you a few things about Tectolic. Uh, from the movie. Uh, here is our hippo and the whale. All right, so understand that they are actually pretty well related. They were, went through a lot of changes, but uh, but still the hippo is more rela closely related to the whale than it is to a pig. All right, and we've already done through this. Um, this is an example of homologous structures. So a whale flipper uh, it has the same parts, they're different sizes, arranged slightly different, but they're all the same parts. That's one reason we understand this. There's like one, two, three, and they're all kind of like organized in the same way. You just extend some, uh, you know, lengthen some of them, make some of them narrower, but essentially all of these are homologous because you have, a, you really do have a one-to-one -one part. You know, you look through here and you see that, wow, this is really amazing. And so a human arm, a turtle's leg, a bat's wing, and a whale's flipper are all homologous structures. So keep in mind uh, that concept. Uh, vestigial structures are, are uh, structures that exist but have lost function. Uh, like we, don't know, we no longer have a tail, but we have a vestigial tail, which is our tailbone. Um, uh, but uh, we don't we don't make it. Sometimes people will have a mutation. Uh, I think there's a movie called Shallow Hal, who he uh, he was one of the people who actually had the reverse mutation and he had a little tail. Uh, and humans are born with that. I think it's like one in every thousand people or something. And usually they remove it when you're born. But you have a little bone sticking out, uh, you know, and it's and you have muscles. You can move it. Uh, but most people, it's removed when you're a child. And there might be people you know who have one. Uh, it's just you can't see it. And uh, if they didn't remove it, but you can remove it as an adult if you have to. Uh, but normally it's removed when they're born. Uh, there are other organisms that have vestigial uh, parts. You can, uh, But uh, understand what a vestigial structure is. It's something you have that you really don't use. Uh, some people say that the uh, appendix is a vestigial structure. Uh, it used to be used to store some special bacteria to digest raw meat, and humans have essentially stopped using it because we have uh, we cook our meat now usually since the invention of fire. So it's a brand new vestigial structure. Structure, uh, not well used. Maybe some people still use it uh, uh, if they eat uh, very raw meat. Uh, you store special enzymes to help digest. Uh, usually uh, tendons and ligaments if you're eating a lot of, of really tough meat and uh, those organisms uh, we, now that we cook meat uh, not as useful all right uh, we won't talk too much here uh, developmental you get the idea molecular this is the same idea with chemicals instead of uh, uh, like arms and 
uh, legs and, and structures instead of physical structures, you can chemically have biochemical enzymes, proteins that, that work and are uh, similar. We have one that we have lost. We have lost the ability to uh, pathway to make vitamin C. Um, I don't have time to give you that story, but it is an interesting one where humans uh, found that they could get more calories out of food if you actually didn't use the, if you didn't make uh, the last enzyme for synthesizing vitamin C. So during an ice age, it is thought that humans lost this enzyme. Uh, somebody had a mutation that uh, no longer gave them the ability to make their own vitamin C. They had to get it out of the food they eat, uh, which is fine. You can survive by just eating it from the food, but uh, not as efficient. But the thing is, when you eliminate that enzyme, you can uh, get more calories out of your food. So during an ice age, you need calories, all right? You may not get a lot of food. The vitamin C, hopefully you can get from your food that you're eating and instead you need more calories and so it is thought that humans or some ancestor of humans uh, lost the ability to make vitamin C so they could gather more calories from their uh, from their food uh, I would love to turn this one back on one you'd probably be healthier by making your own vitamin C uh, and you could probably go eat at McDonald's and not gain so much weight uh, so because you're not getting as many calories from your food. So I would love to turn this one back on. Uh, somebody should genetically engineer everybody to, uh, to, to turn this back on. It'd be very simple to do. Uh, I don't know of anybody having tried it, but uh, we have technology now uh, like CRISPR that would actually allow you to uh, do this. You could, you could theoretically do this and be much healthier. Maybe... Maybe if I ever have my own lab, I would do that to myself, uh, kind of Frankenstein myself, and turn myself into someone who makes their own vitamin C and doesn't get very many calories from their food. I would be much healthier. All right. Um, understand there's a thing called the P53 gene, uh, and it's an interesting idea. It's a gene that uh, causes the cell to uh, kill itself. It's one way of getting rid of cancer if you're... If you're uh, if your cells decide that they are uh, cancerous, they're confused, they're making the wrong sets of proteins in their cells, the cells often activate this gene. They turn it on and it will cause the cell to, kill, to die. And so it's, it's, if you have a good P53, uh, you don't get cancer. Your cells die, but you don't get cancer. Um, and uh, the idea here is this is a common gene found in many, many, many species uh so uh it, it it's basically there to keep you from when your cells get confused to basically have them recognize that and kill themselves and uh, so it's a biochemical uh homologue uh slightly different in different way different species but it usually starts a set of chemical reactions uh, uh that cause the cells to die and many organisms use the p53 and it looks a little different in everybody, so it's homologous because it is different, but it still has the same function. And this is going through the idea that here, how do you tell if, a, if they're from the same, how do you tell that they're homologous? Well, we look at the amino acid sequence, and you can see that this P53 gene, there's a, a protein here, and we're comparing the uh, amino acids that are in this protein, and you can see here's the human one, and, you know, there's only one different between the human and a monkey. And there's only one different from the green monkey. So, actually, these are pretty much the same. Uh, but here there are two different when you get to a rabbit. There are three different when you get to a dog. But essentially, they're making the same protein. All right? And it's P53. All right. Uh, so there are homologous genes as well as homologous structures is what they're pointing out here. All right? Um, here, just giving a different example. Here's something in an E. coli, a DNA sequence. So understand homology. Uh, homology means similar, not exactly the same, but still with the same function. So it's kind of like homologous genes are ones that the sequence have changed, sequence has changed, but they still have pretty much the same function, maybe slightly different. All right. Uh, but they originate, it's clear that they originated from the same gene in an ancestor. 
uh, and you can memorize these t topics. Uh, there's a chance for a multiple choice or a, uh, a true-false on some of these. Um, horizontal gene transfer. Uh, realize that for humans, we, we mix genes using sexual reproduction. You get half of your genes from one parent. And we did this in, in genetics. But bacteria don't divide, they don't reproduce that way. There's no sexual rep reproduction here. Uh, instead, they use, uh, they divide, right? So a uh, bacteria just splits itself in two. Two daughter cells from the original, they're just copies of one another. But there is a way to transfer information uh, through, uh, um, oh, um, I've forgotten their name. Uh, the little loops of DNA, uh, we had it in the last test. Um, wow, completely blank here. Uh, so you have your main, main part of your DNA, your, your supposed the chromosome, but you have the uh, little loops, and those can be transferred horizontally. And uh, just be aware of that. If you didn't remember it from the last exam, it will might crop up on this exam as well. Um, and I'll remember the term here before the end of it, hopefully, and I'll come back. Um, but go look it up. Uh, plasmids, the little loops of DNA are plasmids. So just understand that that leads to horizontal gene transfer. Um, uh, read over this. Um, uh, specifically, uh, the fact that we are similar but not exactly the same as the other apes. And one way that we are different is... Our chromosomes broke up into multiple uh, multiple chromosomes. The humans have chromosome two, but the chimp broke chromosome two into two pieces. The gorilla did the same, as did the orangutan. Either th this happened, either we had a common ancestor that broke them apart, or humans fused them. Uh, it's more likely that they broke apart. So at some point, uh, humans had the same ancestor as chimps, gorillas, and orangutans, and they all had one large chromosome two. But what happened, uh, we had someone, some organism, uh, an ancestor, had a, uh, had a break in a chromosome, and those all ended up being the apes, all of that organism's ancestor, whereas humans continued down a different line. All right. And we're done here with chapter 22. I'm going to give you the link to this one in, on the announcements, as well as a link to what Darwin uh, never knew, uh, the video. And you'll need to watch those ASAP for the final exam. Uh, not the final exam, I'm sorry, for the, uh, for the last exam.